Good morning. We have any visitors this morning? First time visitors. Where are you from, brother? Fayetteville, North Carolina. All right, good to have you. Amen. Anyone else? First time visitors? First time Sunday schooler. All right, fresh meat is Ed Balud say, right, brother? Slice them and dice them. All right, well, good to have you all. We got about two minutes here and we'll start. Sister Mickey, can you see the, the board? Is it glaring? Not a glare. Okay, good. You got to get your production right, you know. All right, it's 10 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Brother Bear, would you open us up, brother? Father, as we bow in your presence, we thank the Lord for another opportunity to come into your house with your people to set feast upon your precious word. I pray for my dear brother. I pray you put a hedge of protection about him. My Father, I pray you would help him to be able to recall what he's prepared and studied as he gives it out. I pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts to receive it, Lord. I pray for the service today. I pray for Pastor Lawson. I pray you touch him physically, spiritually. I pray, Lord, you'd anoint him as he stands to preach. Lord, I pray you'd meet with us again today as you did Wednesday night. My Father, I thank you for the service on Wednesday. Look forward to even greater things today. And for all that's accomplished, we'll give you the praise for it. For it's in Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right. Last week we left off in Romans 4.20. We got to talking about Abraham. We're concluding this chapter in Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> it says how he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Now, we went through that thing in Genesis 15 is the imputed righteousness. And then we see that uh, Genesis 17, you see a uh, Abraham laugh when the Lord said he's going to have a, a son through Sarah. And we talked about how that deceitfulness of sin had hardened his heart and his sin of unbelief over there in, in, uh, in uh, Genesis uh, 17. And so those things, uh, or Genesis 16 rather, and so those things, um, they can harden your heart and that leads to un not believing God anymore even though you started out right sometimes you waver and we'll, we'll talk about that more as we continue through here um, standing in state and all those kind of things but um, we're looking at Abraham here and this is Genesis 15 he said he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness now it was not written for his sake alone but that it was imputed to him but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed. Now, imputed means input, right? Imputed, uh, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Notice the conditional statement, if we believe. See, it's conditioned on faith. Now, we went back, let's go back to Romans 1.5. You see the reference up there. We started this study. We started talking about this thing. <clears throat> Look at Romans 1.5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So we see that obedience is connected with faith. Okay, let's go Romans 16, 26 again. Romans chapter 16, verse 26. Let's 
let's look at verse 25. Paul's talk, talking about the mystery. 1625, Now to him that is of power to, to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. So this revelation was given to Paul. But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. It says in Romans 10, For they have not all obeyed the gospel. So obedience is connected with faith. So notice that Paul says once again, if we believe. So you can have something offered to you, but you may not believe it which is what the gospel has been offered for 2,000 years, but not everyone is going to take it, not, not everyone is going to receive Christ, although Christ would have every man to be saved because He tasted death for every man. Okay, uh, We're not going to get into defending against Calvinism today. we got plenty of that to come when we get to Romans 8 and 9. But understand that He said, if we believe. Okay, So He's talking about Abraham. Okay, so that's not just some sort of something that's going to happen to you because you are some special kind of person. No, it's, 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 it's factored in with, with faith, with belief. Okay, that must be understood. Look at verse, back at verse 24, 424. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Okay, see so the justification? If he, had, if he had not been risen, then we would not be justified. Justified from all things, right? Your sins could not be taken away. For, because it was impossible for blood and bulls and goats to take away sin. Uh, Hebrews 10.4. Okay? So, because He is raised again from the dead, and when you believe on Christ, you're justified from all things. doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter. You can take the worst sinner there ever was, and if they believe on Christ and they trust Him, they can be justified. Now, on our self-righteous minds, we think that's not possible a lot of times because we'll look at people with our perspective as a human being, but we don't think as God thinks. Okay? His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Thank God they are. Or nobody in this room would be justified. Okay? So, keep that in mind. All right, so who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Look at uh, 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3, verse 18. Try to hammer some of these points home because there's so much confusion on salvation out there. People still want to, to do, do, do. And like I said before, Calvary is done, done, done. 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, just like he's talking about, he was delivered for our offenses, right? The just for the unjust. See that? Who's the just? Jesus Christ. Who's the unjust? Us. Alright, so He died in our place. That He might bring us to God. Notice the might. See the free will? Alright, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. There's the resurrection. Death could not hold Him. It could not keep Him. Because He is life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It could not keep Him. All right, and so because of that, we can go free. All right, so let's get, go back to Romans chapter four. So he concludes this chapter talking about being raised again for our justification. Notice, notice we've we've talked about it and talked about it and talked about justification. It is the central focus of Romans. Okay, look at uh, chapter five, verse one. Therefore, being justified by faith, there it is. That sums up all of Romans. The subject, being justified by faith, plus nothing. So when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, that's it. Now, what happens after that with your fellowship? It goes up and down, up and down. That's, that's once again, that's your, that's your state. That's not your standing. We'll get into that here in a moment. But when you are sealed, when you believe on Christ, you're sealed. You're justified. He looks at you just as if you'd never sinned. Why? Because he's looking at his son. That's how he can do that. Because... Why? Because God in the flesh came and died in your place. So just remember that. Okay? So anytime the devil wants to beat you up about your, your, your salvation and all these different things that he tries to throw at you, just take it to Romans 5.1, being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the peace that took place. Go to Ephesians, if you will. 
Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse uh, 14. How do we have peace? Look at verse 14. Well, look at 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For He is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in His flesh the enmity, that's the distance, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in Himself of twain one new man, so making peace." that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So he's brought both sides together. He's reconciled us to God through his Son. So he's the sacrifice for our sin. All right. Uh, let's see here. Look at verse, go, let's go back to Romans 5. Hold your place in Ephesians 2 because we're going we're gonna to flip right back there. He says, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. All right. Notice the access that we have. If you go back to Ephesians 2, look at verse 17. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh, to the Jews and the Gentiles. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Before, no one had access. They had to go through a priest. And only that high priest could go in once a year, and he'd commune with the Lord and put that blood on the mercy seat. But now we have access through Christ. It's just like uh, in the book of Esther, when Esther goes into King Ahasuerus, and, and she goes in there, and, and she's, she's afraid, but she says, okay, I was, this, is the, this is what I was here, put here for, I'm paraphrasing. But she goes into the king, and nobody could come into the king unannounced without an invite. But she was going to go anyway. And she went into the king. And what did the king do? What was the sign? He put out that golden scepter. And she took it. She had access to the throne room. No one else had access, but Queen Esther did. All right, now that's not getting into the typology there, but I want you to see the practical point is that you have access to the throne room. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, See, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, was, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You have access to the Father. Direct access. There's one mediator between God and man, the man... Christ Jesus. He's making that intercession for us. When we pray things, we don't know what we, what we ought to pray. Romans 8, He makes that intercession and He brings it to the Father and He straightens that thing out according to the will of the Father. Wherefore, in the, in the Old Testament, they didn't have that access, did they? Now, what you see today is you, try to, you see some religions out there that try to recreate the Old Testament Levitical priesthood like the Catholic Church does, and they try to make you come through them instead of going right straight to the Father. How can you go to the Father? Through the Son. He always accepts His Son. So, he, so you always have access. And here's what Satan tries to do. He tries to make you think you don't have access. All right? Well, you've done this. You did, well, confess your sins, and He's faithful and just to forgive your sins. Get, get back in the throne room. Get right with God. And He lets you back in. Why? Because His Son. Not because of your goodness, but because of His goodness. Understand that, okay? So that's one of those things where you just have to, you have to get that thing settled down in your mind because if not, Satan's going to mess you up and he's going to try to keep you from doing what God would have you to do. And he doesn't want you to pray to the Father. He doesn't want you to have a prayer life because there's power in prayer. Amen? Amen? He doesn't want that, okay? So understand we have access by faith into the grace when we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory. All right, let's talk about standing. Notice the standing. And then you have state. All right, standing. Where are you at judicially? You're justified. 
Does that change? Can't change. Why? Because your salvation is based on Jesus Christ and what He did. So you're justified, you're seated in heavenly places right now presently, but you're down here. That's called the mystery of the bride. Okay, explain that, try to explain that a little bit. Uh, when Paul talking about that in Ephesians, um, okay, so I, I'm married, right? My wife's sitting back over there. She could be in another state. Are we still married? Yes. Even though she's not, she's not with me presently, she's in another, in another place, but we're still married. Right? Okay, that's your state. That doesn't change. That's your relationship to Christ. You're adopted, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Okay? That does not change. However, state, what's that have to do with? That has to do with your fellowship. Okay? What's going on in your life at that time? All right, let's use the marriage again. So, me and my wife are married, but if we're not in fellowship, maybe we're sleeping in separate beds. We're not talking, but we're still married. The relationship didn't change, even though the state can fluctuate. Okay? That's your fellowship. Let's turn over here to uh, Philippians. I'll show it to you from the Bible, not just my words. Go over here to Philippians. <clears throat> Look at Philippians 4.11. He says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, there were to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. See the state? That's where he's at in his life. Whatever state you're in. Okay? This is, this is where so many people get tripped up in thinking they can lose their salvation because they may have lost their fellowship because they did something to grieve the Holy Spirit of God, and now they've lost that fellowship of the Lord, and now they're no longer walking in the light as He is in the light. Therefore, they don't have fellowship with one another. That's 1 John, right? But what do you do to get back in fellowship? If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9, fellowship. Notice, if you go home and read 1 John chapter 1, look at the context. What is it about? Fellowship. You're already in Christ, but you can lose your fellowship. Okay? Get that down, because Satan's going to work you over. And that, he does that with so many people, because they don't understand this right here. Standing, justified, in Christ. Can't lose it, but I can lose this. How many times have I went over that? A bunch of times. Why do you think I go over that so many times? Because it's important. Because it plagues so many Christians. Amen? So I can't hammer that one enough. You can't enjoy your, your salvation if you think you can lose it all the time. You're constantly going to be a nervous wreck, which is where the Roman Catholics, they like to keep their people, Church of Christ, and some of, some of these other denominations that think you can lose it. They like to keep them stirred up. Why? Because I can control you. I can be a little Protestant Pope, and I can start to say, well, you know what, you're not dressing right, you're not doing this right, not doing that. Oh, you probably lost it. And then you go home, oh, how do I get it back? Oh, I've got to speak in tongues. I've got to do all these things. That's why I'm so big of a, uh, an advocate of teaching and preaching the book. Because this is what your authority is. Okay, when I was in college and, having, and I was going through to get my degree in history, all right, you have to go through and you have, when you write a paper, you have to give references. Because it's not my opinion that people care about. Right? I'm not the expert, so this person over here says this, so on and so forth, and you start comparing these, and you put them in your paper, and you got to have references, because there's source material. There's authority that comes from those things, from those historians, right? Well, this is your authority. This is your reference material. Anytime somebody wants to get you to doubt something, you got to know the book. You say, well, come on over here to Romans 5.1. I'm going to show you how I'm justified by faith, plus nothing. Says the book. So this, this is what the Reformation was all about. You have to understand in history why that was so important, what Luther did with that 95 Theses. And if you don't know what Martin Luther did, you need to get in some history and understand what he did. When he went to challenge the Catholic Church in, in uh, October 31st, 1517, and he wrote his, 90, his 95 Theses, 
Those theses were based, were based on things that he had recognized that were taking place in the Catholic Church based on tradition and church fathers, not based on what the Scripture said. You see, so when he got his, uh, what's called Erasmus Bible, his text, his Greek text, Martin Luther went through there and said, wait a second, everything we're doing is based on tradition, not based on the book. We need to get back to the authority of Scripture. And so when he challenged the Catholic Church, boy, that set off like a wildfire. And he was a heretic. Okay, and he, and he could have suffered being burned at the stake for doing what he did. But he said, well, I'm not going to back up by these things, by these words I stand. And he, and he wouldn't back up. When he translated that Bible into German from Greek, okay, and those German people for the first time in over a thousand years had a New Testament in their language that they could understand, it set the world on fire. Okay, why? Because the authority was the book. It wasn't tradition, it wasn't church fathers, it wasn't any of that bunch of nonsense. It was the book. Amen? Okay, so we got to understand devil tries to worry, about, worry out about some of these things, take them to the book. Your faith is in what God said, all right? What the fact is, all right? So let's go back to Romans 5. He says, We have access by faith into the, this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. All right. All right, let's get into some, some more doctrinal stuff here. All right, the hope of His glory. It's important. So, we're going to go through some of these here. Now, what's he talking about? The hope. All right. So, the hope of his glory, the second coming of Christ, what we have to look forward to. First of all, I want you to go to Acts 17. And I want you to notice what Paul is being accused of by the Jews. He's in Thessalonica. Notice what Paul is uh, preaching about. Go to Acts 17, verse uh, 5. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy and took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason, Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Boy, didn't they ever. Whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the, to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. So what was, what was Paul preaching? Not only was he preaching the gospel, the grace of God, he was preaching the second coming of Christ. He was preaching the whole counsel of God. Okay? One, of the, one of the failures of today's church is they don't preach the whole counsel of God. It's love, 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 love. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't preach those things, but you need to preach the whole counsel of God. There needs to be a balance on what you are preaching and what you are teaching. That's why people are so deceived, okay? So let's look at the glory, what it's talking about. Let's go to Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16. Look at verse 27. Scripture is Scripture. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His, with his angels, and then He shall reward every man according to His works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death, till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. All right, Son of Man. All right, there's that term, right? Let's go back to Daniel chapter 7. What's he quoting from? Old Testament. He's quoting the Scripture. This is another one where the, the so-called scholars, they like to say Daniel was not a real person. He wasn't a prophet. Well, the Lord called him a prophet. Matthew 24, he called him a prophet. Look at Daniel 7, 13. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him here before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and, and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. That's his glory. That's the day that we're hoping for. That's the day that the world is looking for. They're not looking forward to it, but we are. But the creation's looking forward to it because it's going to get regenerated. All right? So, we're looking for that hope of His glory, which is His kingdom coming in. Let's go back to Matthew 24. Look at Matthew 24, verse 30. 
Well, look at 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Anybody know who preached that in the book of Acts? Peter. Acts chapter 2. He was fully expecting the Lord to return. He's preaching Joel 2. All right. And then shall uh, appear, the, uh, appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. What did you just read in Daniel? Same thing. Same thing. Right? Look at uh, Matthew 25, verse 31. Matthew 25, 31, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And this is the judging of the nations, sheep nations and goat nations. That's at the end of the tribulation, the end of that seven-year period, um, called Daniel's 70th week, right? Let's go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 37. This is James and John that are speaking. Mark 10, 37. They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left, in thy glory. That's the throne of his glory. Okay, that's in the kingdom. All right. Go to Luke 9, verse 32. Luke 9, 32, well, verse 31, this is the Mount of Transfiguration, who appeared in glory and spake of his, his decease, which he should, be, should, uh, should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. All right, so Peter saw his glory and his kingdom coming in. That's the Mount of Transfiguration. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Last uh, reference here. 2 Peter chapter 1. Verses 16 and 17, or I believe that is. Oh, I'm in 1 Peter. That's why it looked wrong. 2 Peter. Yes. Verse 16 and 17. For we have not followed cunningly, cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Notice the power and the coming. That's the second advent. That's what they witnessed on the Mount of Transfiguration. All right. For, for He received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from excellent glory, from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So that tells you right there, scripture, scripture, what they were witnessing. That's why he made the statement, there would be some standing here that shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Right after that, you see the Mount of Transfiguration. They get to see the second coming of Christ. See that? So, so somebody might take Matthew 16 and say, well, that never happened. Yeah, it did. He just took them up in a moment of time, showed them something. That's what Revelation chapter 1 is. If you read Revelation chapter 1, we don't have time. What are you seeing? You're seeing the second advent. Okay? So, Scripture is Scripture. You'll also see that in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Daniel 10 and, and, and a bunch of different other references in the Old Testament. But you have to understand, the Lord can do it how He feels like. The Lord can't, He, he, can't, he can't lie. So when he says something, our, our little finite minds don't understand because we're linear. We think linear. We think on a time scale. Well, God stands outside of time. So if he wants to take Daniel up here or Ezekiel or John or anybody else, take him up here, Paul, to the third heaven and show him something, well, that's his business to do it. Now, whether or not you believe that's your problem. But that's what the book said. Problem is, we, we, we have these little finite minds and we can't, we can't act on faith. We just set them well, that, that couldn't happen. We, we try to, you know, use logic and all that kind of stuff and, and try to figure out God. Well, good luck, man. I mean, if you can, if you can tell, tell me if you've ever seen an ass talk, a donkey, you ever seen one of those preach a message to you? But he said it happened. 
because he can do it any way he feels like. He's like, all right, you smart Alex, watch this. I'll let that guy talk. I'll get this, I'll get this, old, this old sinner up here, and then I'll call him to preach, and then guess, guess what? He'll be teaching you the Bible. You think he's so smart? All right, he uses foolish things to confound the wise. Sometimes God uses people that don't fit your, fit your description of what you think should be a preacher. Amen. Amen. So, that's the hope of His glory. That's what we're waiting on. Now, let's get back to Romans 5 and get back to some practical. Okay? Because all that stuff, that will puff your head up. Alright? You start getting all the prophecy. People get, they get puffed up heads. But let's look at it here. Let's look at the practical. Alright, Romans 5, 2. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience is experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Now that doesn't, see that's contrary to how the world thinks, right? Glory in tribulations. How could I possibly glory in tribulations? Okay, well, let's look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. Familiar passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse 6. For though I would desire to glory. Now, which part of him desires to glory? That's that flesh. That's that old man. Likes to get glory. Amen. I shall not be a fool. Oh, so it says you're a fool if you're trying to get glory. If you're trying to steal God's glory, you're a fool. Amen. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Now Paul, he just told you right before this, he went to the third heaven, and God gave him some revelations directly. Now you think he could have got puffed up? You think he could have tickled some ears with the things that Paul saw? Sure he could have. And that's, that's a danger. Now he said, not a novice lest be lifted up with pride, fall into condemnation of the devil. That was the devil's problem, wasn't it? Pride. So look, look at here though. He says, through the abundance of the revelation there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Keep him down. The messenger of Satan to buffet me. That literally means punch him in the face. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. See, you're weak. When you're weak, he's strong. Amen? You'll notice in the seven ascensions, I guess you will, or however you want to look at it as far as the, the Christian growth and the life, babes, children, little children, all those young men, all those, there's seven steps. But you'll notice in 1 John that if you go through those things and, it's, and it and ends with the elder and Philemon, you'll notice that the older the person gets, they get weaker physically, but stronger spiritually. Why? Because they've been trusting the Lord that whole time, just like Abraham he was stronger at the end than he was at the beginning. See, you get physically weaker, you've got a thorn in your flesh to keep you down. Why? Lest you should be exalted above measure. Lest people start thinking you more than you, than you really are. Okay, that's why God keeps that thorn in that flesh. Because if not, we'll get big, heady, and high-minded and puffed up. Amen. Especially if God's given you a lot of revelation in His Word. Okay? God didn't make this book so that preachers could make a living off of it. He didn't make this book so preachers could get glorified. He, he wrote this book for you that, so His Son could get glorified. Amen? Alright, so He said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in the weakness. He said that the power of Christ may rest upon me. How do you get to know the power of God? And how do you get the power of God? Well, let's go to Philippians It's one thing to know of the Lord, it's another thing to know Him. Philippians 3.10 Now he gets done 
telling you, I, you know, I, I can all these things, but dung that I may know, or, uh, that I may know Him, where He says, um, well, you know what I'm saying. I don't, let's go to verse 10. He said, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings be made conformable unto His death. The fellowship of His sufferings. You're appointed to suffer. Why is that? Well, so that you can get something on the other side. Go to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. So this, doesn't, this is contrary to how the world thinks. The world thinks that you're going to get a blessing. If you're going to get a blessing, God is going to give you boats and cars and houses and money and all these things. Because that's what the Gentiles seek after. But that's not how God blesses you. He blesses you spiritually. Look at uh, verse four, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and verse 4. So that we, have, we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. So the things that you suffer for down here, you're going to get rewarded for on the other side. Now you might get some things, you might get rewarded for some things in this life, but this life is not all that there is. See, if you do everything in light of the judgment seat of Christ, it'll straighten you out. It'll help to purify you in your actions, your deeds. Okay, it'll keep you straight. Why? Because there's accountability. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Titus. We didn't run one final reference because I was waiting for this. Look at Titus 2. Uh, 2.12. Well, 2.11. Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and, unworldly, un, and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Why? Because you've got a testimony, folks. Amen? He says, looking for that blessed hope, there it is, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Purity, pure and white. When does that take place? Judgment seat of Christ. But if you have things, if you make decisions in the light of the judgment seat of Christ, it'll purify you. It'll keep you holy, it'll keep you clean, it'll keep you within the boundaries. Okay? Can you go outside the boundaries? Sure you can. All right? Is there consequences for that? Yes, there is, according to the scripture. Okay, but that thing will purify you. But he says, let's go back to Romans 5. So this passage here is packed. We glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. So the things that you're going through, it works patience in you. Because you have to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I can remember just, you know, when we'd have to go on humps in the Marine Corps, that was like a death knell. I remember when I came off uh, recruiter's assistance, I spent like 26 days and I didn't PT one day. Um, I came back and my roommate, Armando Garcia, he said, uh, hey man, we got a hump tomorrow. That's a hike, in case you don't know that. I said, how long? He said, 18 miles. I was like, oh, okay. And I knew I hadn't prepared. You know, I hadn't PT'd. I wasn't ready. And I'm an idiot and I bought brand new Boots. Hey, this is this is why they call you a boot, because you don't know anything. So I bought these brand new shiny jungle boots, and um, we stepped off on that hike. And I'm kind of anecdote here, but we stepped off on that hike. And I remember the first first hill we went up was called Spaghetti Hill, and it's one of these kind of things. Looks like spaghetti, and it took an hour to get up that thing. And man, my heels were done. And it was a full moon out, and I'll never forget this. This guy posted. He hated the hump so bad, and he, he starts, to, I'm just telling his stories, but he, he, he said they're throwing up, and, I'm, and you could see these little white things on the ground. I said, Poston, what is that? He said, man, I took like five no-dos. 
and it, you can see the little white specks on the ground, you know, it's full moon out. And I'll never forget, and um, that thing, I, would, I wanted somebody to shoot me in the head. Because we got lost, and we put, he, the battalion commander added another three miles, so it became a 21-mile hike. And it was this, in, in Camp Pendleton in California, it's just a bunch of ridgebacks. And I remember this guy, Lance Corporal Ryan's, pulling me up a hill because my quads were just locking up. All right? Well, guess, guess what that taught me? It taught me a lot of things. But, man, you had to endure that. You just had to get through it. And sometimes that's how it is in the Christian life. You'd rather just, Lord, just take me out now like Elijah wanted to be. Right? And that's what I, I mean, I just, oh, just tell me to shoot me. And, uh, but you couldn't, you couldn't stop because everybody else is, here comes the, here, the battle train's moving. You can't stop. And you certainly don't want to look like a, a, a sissy to the rest of the guys. So you just got to suck it up. And you've got to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And that's sometimes how your Christian life is. Tribulation worketh patience. I was taught some patience and I was also taught not to buy brand new boots. Okay? I was taught a few things. You better be prepared next time this comes along. All right? And so let's look back at the verse in Romans 5. Patience, experience, experience, hope. All right? He says over the book of James, let, let uh, patience have her perfect work. Let it work. Okay? So many times we get into something we want to get out of it. Well, God's still working something. He's, still, he's, he's doing something with you to teach you some patience and some temperance. Okay, that's going to be further, it's going to help you, help mold your character for on down the road. See, God's got you in something, and I can guarantee everybody in this room is going through something. And you're like, God, just take me out of this. Well, not yet. Let patience have her perfect work. Why? He's developing character in you. If you just get out of it, then you don't get the character. And that's the point. And hope maketh not ashamed. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Well, all the things that Paul went through, if somebody could be ashamed, it could have been Paul, but he was never ashamed of it, right? Because the things that happened to him fell out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. And we are all products, by the way, of what the Apostle Paul did 2,000 years ago. So he had something to look forward to. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. We'll end here. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since man, by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. We're not just looking at this life. We're looking beyond. Therefore, we can go through things and we have that hope. And the more things you go through, some, you, you may have heard this, that trouble or experience is just trouble. The more trouble that you go through and God gets you through things, the more faith and you have confidence in that the Lord's going to get you through it the next time. And it gives you the hope. And we have something to look forward to. All right? So hopefully that will encourage you, whatever it is that you're going through, because we all have storms and troubles that we deal with. He's trying to work something into you. He said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Whatever he's putting in you, he wants it to come out. Because sometimes you may have to comfort somebody else. And you can't comfort someone if you've never been through their trouble. Amen? All right, we'll go ahead and end there. All right, Father, Lord God, we just thank you once again for your word. And um, thank you for this day, Lord. And just uh, thank you for the liberty that you gave us here today. I just pray that uh, folks are edified, they're, that they are strengthened by your word and established in it. And I just pray for those that uh, are or listening or hearing online or anybody in here today that's lost and does not know you and has never been justified by faith. I pray today that they'd put their trust and confidence in you. Pray for our pastor. Pray that uh, you be with him as he breaks the bread of life one more time. Pray Brother Barry as he leads the singing, Father. I just pray that uh, you'd bind up any devil that would hinder the service today. And Father, we just thank you. In Lord Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. All right. Thank you all, folks.
보자. 
All right, it's good to be in the Lord's house. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, we want to welcome you to Temple Baptist of Fountain City in the good old Southern style. We just uh, plum tickled to death to have you here. And those that's uh, tuning in faithfully uh, over the internet, watching the live stream, we want to uh, invite you uh, and thank you for tuning in and praying for the service. Join in with us as we praise and worship the Lord Jesus. Let's stand up, take the All-American Church hymnal, turn to page number 67, page 67. We'll do the first, second, and last verse. Calvary. Good to have you. Good to be here. We'd like to welcome you this morning. If you're visiting with us today first time, would you raise your hand? We'll give you a card, let you fill it out, drop it in a plate and it passes in a moment. Good night. We've got folks everywhere. We want you to, you're welcome. Good to have you. I want to make sure everybody gets a card and just join in with us in the service today and make yourself right at home. The folks watching by Internet, we're live streaming, Lord willing, all over the world. God bless every one of you. I hope we get something from the scriptures, from the message, from the lesson, and from the worship service. Now, there goes a good looking one right there now, believe me. Amen. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll start over here. Were you visiting with us first time? You folks, where are you from? Georgia. All right. Good to have you with us today. All right. Anybody else over in this side? Yes, sir. Columbia, Tennessee. All right, good to have you. Anyone else this side? All right, up in the front, yes, sir. Georgetown, Texas. All right, good, good to have you. Yes, folks in the middle here on back. Yes, sir. Ohio. All right, good night. Good to have you. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir. Greenville, North Carolina. All right, good to have you. On back in the middle there. Where in Tennessee? Rogersville, all right, I know exactly where that is. Good place, yes. All right, on above Morristown. Anyone else first time? Yes, sir. Morristown, <laughs> you are. You're not far apart. <laughs> all right. Anyone else in the middle here first time? All right, back here up to the front here. You folks from the front? You're from Knoxville, God bless you. Good home folk, good to have you with us. Yes, sir, amen. All right, anywhere? You, anyone else first time? Yes, sir. Okay, I heard North Carolina where? Fayetteville. Fayetteville. All right, yes, yes, sir. 
All right. Anyone else first time? Yes. Charlotte? All right. Yes, sir. Good to have you. Anyone else first time? All right. That's a bunch of visitors. You're welcome. God bless every one of you. Amen. Good to have you. Glad you saw fit to come by and visit with us today. May the good Lord bless you today. Now. Amen.
everybody stand up, fellowship, shake hands as the choir comes down. the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's the only one we want in here. Y'all go ahead and be seated. Let's have the ushers come up. We'll take up the offering. It's good to see Brother Tony Stanley now. Amen. He's been through a heart attack and uh, treatments. Amen, brother. God bless you now. Amen. That's the way heart attacks are sometimes. No warning. They just come on you. That's it. There they come. Let's pray this morning. All right. Brother McLeod, lead us in prayer, please.
It's beautiful. Sister Andrea Martin's going to sing for us this morning. I'd like to give her an invitation to come on up here. Yes, sir. I wonder about that. Good. Amen. That's good, brother. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> was, is your wife in California? I was wondering if, if that, that's where she was headed. All right.
that's good. I hope you notice that the altar is always open, folks. The fact of the matter is, we go by the scripture, it says that we have an altar that they know not of that serve the tabernacle of the temple. Amen. Every place you put your foot is holy ground now in the grace of God. Turn the book of Matthew chapter 3 with me this morning, please. Matthew chapter number 3 and verse number 1. That's good singing. Little Lydia with her mama. Amen. Matthew chapter number 3 and verse number 1. The scripture says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Father, anoint the messenger and bless your word as it goes forth in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. If you notice, John the Baptist had a, a unique diet. The scripture says that he had wild honey and locust. Did you know that archaeologists have found honey that has been, that is over thousands of years old and is still edible? Did you know that? They say that honey is one of the few things on this earth that if you seal it up or try to take care of it in that fashion, because of the nature of honey, because of the, the compound of honey, it kills bacteria and essentially lasts forever. Isn't that a remarkable thing? A land flowing with milk and honey, he said to the, to the children of Israel as they came out of Egypt with their leeks and their onions. John the Baptist or John the Baptizer who showed up all of a sudden like Elijah the prophet, out he comes unannounced by the religious professionals of his day and he begins to preach, repent. It was a simple message, repent. But the truth is that God had anointed him and called him because he was his prophet. And they heard him, and they responded to his preaching, and they came, and they listened to what John had to say, and his message drove home to the soul. And they repented. They got right with God. He was the one that Isaiah said would go before the Messiah, the Mashiach, and he did. He laid the foundation. He prepared the people. He prepared the way of the Lord. John the Baptist was and ever since then a prophet. He was a prophet. The scripture says in Luke chapter 16, the law and the prophets were until John, but since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. It forces you to understand that God does certain things, certain ways during a certain period of time and that John the Baptist was the ending of one period of time, but it was also the beginning of another period of time. His message was, print, was repent for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. In Luke chapter number 11 and verse number 11, our Lord Jesus Christ makes an assessment of John, and here's what he says about him. In Luke chapter number 11 and verse 11, Verily I say to you, among them that are born of woman, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. <coughs> this is quite a thing compared with Abraham and with Moses and with David and with Job and with Daniel, some of the greatest men that ever walked the face of this earth. For example, Noah, Daniel, and Job are mentioned in the book of Ezekiel because of their righteousness. These are righteous men. It doesn't say that of Abraham. It doesn't say that of David. But it certainly says that of Job. And it says it of Daniel. And it says it of Noah. And yet the Bible says that none of them are greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a unique individual. There never was one like before him nor after him. That was John the Baptist. Elijah was a type of him in the Old Testament text. In the book of Matthew chapter number 11 and verse number 14, he says this about John the Baptist. If you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Now, why would he say that? I want you to listen to me this morning, folks, because we're going to try to take you into the Bible and open up the New Testament and, try and begin to understand how that we can rightly divide the word of truth. John the 
the Baptist, therefore, is a marker. He's a mile marker. He's, a, he's, something, he's someone that cannot be uh, simply pushed to the side or overlooked or forgotten. No, John the Baptist is very important. Notice some remarkable things about John. He, and like Elijah in the Old Testament, both of them are prophets. And the Lord said in the book of Malachi, chapter number 4, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So he told these people that Elijah was coming. John and Elijah had a message for the king. In the case of Elijah, his message was for Ahab. In the case of John the Baptist, his message was for Herod Antipas. Both John and Elijah were confronted by a Jezebel. Yes, sir. Elijah preached to Jezebel in the Old Testament, and John the Baptist preached to Herodias in the New Testament. Herodias was ever much a Jezebel as Jezebel in the Old Testament. They were both wicked, vile, godless women. John and Elijah were prepared to lead Israel out of a catastrophe. Both of them. Elijah was sent to show them who God was. John the Baptist was sent to prepare them for the coming of the kingdom of heaven. And both women, Jezebel and Herodias, became object lessons of the axiom of Scripture, you reap what you sow. Listen to what one of the ancient historians says. Now, of course, we read in the Scripture that Jezebel was eaten by the dogs. If you've read the Bible, you know that's what happened. And, of course, what it means is this, that Jezebel was the refuse of the earth. She was the garbage upon, garbage upon the face of the earth. And, therefore, she was good for nothing but food for the dogs. Now, here's what it says about uh, Herodias, wherefore the just vengeance of God burned against all who were concerned in this crime. Herod was defeated by Aretas. Afterwards, he was banished with Herodias to Leons and deprived of his tetrarchy and everything by Caligula. At the instigation of Agrippa, the brother of Herodias, as Josephus relates, moreover, the head of the dancing daughter was cut off by means of ice. Now, who is the dancing daughter? If you'll remember, John the Baptist says, it's not right for you to have your brother Philip's wife. He, he publicly castigated them for what they were doing. This was incest in the sight of the Jewish people. They could not live with this. John the Baptist, therefore, had preached the truth, but it was going to cost him dearly. But God was about to teach them something. And so in the case of Herodias, when Herod's passions were inflamed by the dancing of her daughter, Salome, he said to her, I'll give you as much as half the kingdom. Ask of me. And Herodias says, I want the head of John the Baptist on a charger. What a wicked thing to say. A wicked thing indeed. John was locked up in jail. Now listen to what happens. Hear what nice for us says. As she... Salome was journeying once in the winter time. Remember, she's the one who danced before Herod. As she was journeying in the winter time, and a frozen river had to be crossed on foot, the ice broke beneath her. Not without the providence of God. Straightway she sank down up to her neck. This made her dance and wriggle about with all the lower parts of her body, not on land, but in the water. So Salome continued to dance. Her wicked head was glazed with ice and at length severed from her body by the sharp edges, not of iron, but of the frozen water. So she was beheaded in the water by the dance that she danced to have John the Baptist. Thus in the very ice, she displayed the dance of death and furnished a spectacle to all who beheld it, which brought to mind what she had done. And now we have another case. Herod Antipas, with Herodias, his incestuous mistress, was banished first to Gaul and afterwards to Liber in Spain. Herodias, dancing upon the river Sychorus, when it was frozen, fell through the ice and perished miserably. My, my, my. What happens to these two women? The Bible says in the book of Galatians, chapter number 6, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. I take that personally. Be carefully observe my life and how I'm living before the Lord. If you sow to the flesh, the Bible says you shall of the flesh reap corruption. Make no mistake about it. Don't play with God. 
and you're not going to outsmart him, and you're not going to run away from him. God Almighty is God Almighty. The ministry of John the Baptist, it says, if you will receive it. Matthew chapter number 17, the Mount of Transfiguration, prepares us for something about John. In Matthew chapter number 17 and verse 1, after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto them, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make there here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Now what we have here is showing up without a question. Something is going on. Elijah has showed up on top of the Mount of Transfiguration. Now remember, the Lord Jesus Christ told us in the book of Malachi, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Amen. So we not only have Elijah coming in typology in John the Baptist, but we have Elijah coming physically as he appeared on top of that mountain. This means that 2,000 years ago, God was about to bring a kingdom down upon this earth, and he was going to bring it to the Jewish people. It's important to understand this. The Jewish people had a choice to make. The kingdom of heaven given to them with the king. But the king was rejected. And so when they rejected the king, they rejected the kingdom. You can't have one without the other. It's important to understand, therefore, the progression of Scripture. I hope you're following with me. When John the Baptist showed up, his ministry was to announce the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only was his ministry to announce the coming of the Lord Jesus, his ministry was to be the fulfillment of the prophecy of the book of Malachi, chapter number four, that he would be Elijah the prophet if they would receive him. Now that's quite a remarkable thing when you think about it. But they rejected him. And when they rejected him, they rejected John the Baptist. They rejected his ministry. They rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They rejected all of that. Here's what happens. Look at Matthew chapter 13 in verse number 10. I hope you're following with me because this is a great lesson to learn how to, in, to interpret and write to divide the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 10, his disciples came and said unto him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? How many of you have been told a parable is an earthly lesson with a heavenly meaning? You've been told that. Well, that's all right as far as it goes. But it goes much further than that. You see, note carefully in verse number 11 what the Lord said to them about the parable. Look at verse 11. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Did you see that? Did you see that? He plainly told them that the parable was given to certain people. The purpose of the parable, therefore, was to cover up something and only reveal it to a certain few. The parable is parabole. It means to go alongside the light or the truth. In other words, it's going alongside of it. The parable, therefore, is not a complete expression of all the light that God wants to give on a subject. You can preach the parables. You can teach the parables. And they have a certain amount of great revelation and truth to them. But they do not give you the full revelation. Why? Because they were given to begin with only to a certain few to understand so much of what is going on. Notice carefully when John wrote his gospel in John chapter number 20, he said, these things are written unto you that you might believe and believe have everlasting life, right? That's what he said. Have you noticed that the word parable doesn't show up in the gospel of John? Why does it show up in the gospel of John? Because John is not writing about the kingdom of heaven and he's not writing about parables. He's writing about the grace of God and the new birth. You see the difference? The gospel of John is written long after Christ had ascended and Paul was saved. 90, 95 AD. The gospel of John is the door that opens up unto the age of grace. The gospel of John, is, my friend, opens up to us today. The preaching of the gospel of the grace of God. I don't preach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. 
I don't preach the Beatitudes as the gospel. I preach them in the sense that they are instructive. All scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's instructive. There's much we can learn from it. But when I preach to you the gospel of the grace of God, I tell you that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried according to the scriptures, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's what the apostle said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. And Paul and John, rather when he wrote the gospel of John said, these things are not written to be hidden. They are not written in parabolic form. They are not written for only a select few. These things are written that ye might believe and believing have everlasting life. Amen. And there's a reason for that. So it's important to understand that the New Testament is a book of progressive revelation. And as it reveals to us the gospel, it reveals to us the ministry. It reveals to us the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. It reveals to us great truths to help us understand God's word. But not only that, it makes the Bible intriguing. It's important. It makes it, it, it uh, when I open up the Bible and begin, to, and begin to read over the word of God, it blows my mind sometimes how it's woven together. The word of God, it's quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, if you notice over here in the book of, in the book of Matthew, You'll find in chapter number 14 something I want to call your attention to. Matthew chapter number 14. This is important. I want you to look at it very carefully. Matthew chapter number 14 and verse number 1. If I can get it to it and get it opened up. Here we go. There we are. Matthew chapter number 14 and verse number 1. Remember now, Herodias says, give me John the Baptist's head on a charger. You know what she did? She had him put to death. And why? Because Salome had danced in front of him and fired up his passions. And Herod Antipas like a fool and made a fool of himself. But note what happens now. Chapter number 14 of Matthew verse number 1. At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard the fame of Jesus. Verse 2. And said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. He's obsessed with John the Baptist. He is haunted by John the Baptist. This is wearing him out about John the Baptist. You see before this incident with Herodias, he and John had gotten along pretty good. He'd listen to him, they'd talk, they'd converse, and this, that, and so forth and so on. It was the woman Jezebel that had turned him into what happened to him. And so now he was haunted by what happened to John the Baptist. Let me read a couple of stories for you today. This is a spirit being. You're in the church of God. Do you know that? You know the Holy Spirit is in this house today. Don't you know that? Do you understand that every one of you in this house, every last one of you, you're spirit beings that has a soul and you're living in a body. You know that? I've been to the graveyard many times through the decades and we've buried bodies, but I have never buried a soul. And I've never buried a spirit, but I've buried plenty of bodies. From dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Abraham said, Lord, ash, I am ashes. I know what I am. I came from ashes, dust and ashes. If you ever expect to be any more than that, it'll come from the breath of God. Life will come only from the Almighty. I got a little digging into serial killers. I found out that serial killers, serial killers, one man spent back 30 years ago, he went, spent 25 years, a college professor, 25 years going back into the history and, and newspaper articles and police reports and doing his research into serial killers. He wanted to learn something so he could give it to the nation and help law enforcement and so forth. One of the things that he learned about serial killers is that the majority of serial killers kill for the sheer joy of it. Did you get that? Some kill out of anger, some kill out of need for many different reasons. But the vast majority of serial killers do it because they get joy. They get a, they get a, they get a high from it. They, they, they get, it feeds their ego. It builds them up. Ted Bundy, of course, was one like that. And many others you can name today. All right? So they kill. 
and they take the life of the individual. But it doesn't stop there. Here's a serial killer in England. His name is Mark Bridger. 2013, 2013, he was a pedophile killer of April Jones. He claimed he's haunted by the ghost of the five-year-old girl. She's dead now. She's gone. He took her. But he can't get away from the voices. He can't get away from the spirit. He can't get away from the apparitions. And he says at times some old man will bring her to him. And they will appear in his jail cell. And he has to live with that for the rest of his life. Now you say, preacher, is that her ghost? Listen, as I say to you, this is the church of God. We read the Bible. There's a whole world of spirit beings out there. Demonic, my dear friends. Evil, wicked spirits that can impersonate a human being. They're called familiar spirits in the Old Testament. We know what the Bible says. For thousands of years, this book has been recording the spirit world. And I'll tell you right now, it's not a joke. When you take the life of someone like that, and you snuff out their life, and you get your high, and you've murdered them, you're going to live with that for the rest of you, if you live for the rest of your life. Now a name that you all know, his name is Alfonso Capone. Al Capone. Have you ever heard of him? You ever heard of Al Capone? He's all over the news, has been. I've heard of him all my life. And Al Capone, I've heard the story of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Do you remember Bugs Moran? You remember the South Side, the North Side, Chicago? You remember they met inside? They, they, they came in impersonating the law enforcement. They lined them up against the wall. And they took a 45 caliber Tommy guns, shot them to death. 45 ACPs, they shot them to death. And the bodies dropped to the floor. And then they turned around and they walked out. Well, Capone, for the rest of his life, they say that his bodyguards could hear him in his in his room in the hotels and places he could hear they could hear capone in there saying leave me alone leave me alone leave me alone and he was crying out to the ghost of the men that he'd murdered on that day that he'd called them to die capone lived with that until he died till he left this world you say preacher what happened it wasn't the ghost of the men no no but it was the spirit being Yes, don't mess with the spirit world, folks. Don't play games with it. Leave your Ouija boards, your tarot cards, your dope. You realize that dope puts you in an altered state of consciousness? Did you know they're trying to bring LSD back in? LSD is one of those hallucinogenic drugs. They take trips on it. Back in the 60s, they started taking trips. Back then, they were jumping out of 7th, 8th, 9th, 10-story buildings and hit the floor, hit the deck because they thought they could fly. Their mind was blown. They, they, were, they were disconnected with the world they lived in. We live in such a, in such a drug-induced society today. People don't know what you're talking about. I mean, look at the drugs today, though. They're just like fentanyl. You get that, you're dead. You're gone. Don't mess with the spirit world. Now I want to read in the New Testament about a man who was haunted. He was haunted by the life that he had lived. Turn and read about him in 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 15. He's haunted by the life that he had once lived. 1 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. He said, but have it for this cause, I obtained mercy. Underline that. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. How many little girls, how many little boys did he lead back to Jerusalem and watch them stoned to death? How many mamas had their babies torn from their arms and from their hands. And Saul of Tarsus stood there and he watched them die. Saul stood there when Stephen was stoned to death. They piled their coats at a young man's feet. I believe he was haunted, 
haunted, eaten alive with his past. This is why he says, of all the sinners on this earth, I am chief. He meant what he said. He didn't do it for effect. It wasn't, it wasn't drama time. It was real time. I mean, he was really saying. I want you to notice what he says in verse 13, 1 Timothy chapter number 1. He says, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious. Injurious. Now, we have an English word taken straight from Greek. That English word is hubris. How many of you heard that word before? That's straight from, it's pure Greek. Hubris. Here's the Greek word. Hubris taste. Hubris taste. Here's what it means. To act with insolence. Arrogance. An insolent persecutor of others who mistreats them for the pleasure which the affliction of the wrong brings him. Did you get this? This is the word that Saul of Tarsus used to describe his own feelings when he was watching these people being put to death. Like the same thing that a serial killer feels. Now, if you minister to people, if you walk down death row in the prisons, if you go to the jails on Maloneyville Road, if you go minister to people who are in dire straits, they need help, this is a good scripture to take them to. Because the man who said, I took delight in killing people, wrote half of your New Testament. Now note what he said. Verse 16, for this cause I obtain mercy. There we are. That's the message of the apostle. Mercy. What do you mean, preacher? Mercy. If God's got mercy, if he has mercy for a man that can kill and take joy in killing, then he's got mercy for you. Anybody sitting in here this morning, you're watching there live? Anybody, you're haunted? You're haunted by your memories? You live long enough to have memories? I got them. I sit around and think about things that happened 60 years ago. Fact is, I can remember some of that stuff better than I can remember what I ate yesterday. Amen. What do you do, preacher? Well, you got a battle that's going to, you're going to have that battle till you die. It's the battle between the old man and the new man. Between the brain and the memory banks and then the new man. <coughs> he said, put on Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Had the apostle Paul forgotten his past? How many of you believe he'd forgotten it when he wrote this? Of course not. That was as real and alive to him as it could possibly be. But he gives you something to help you. He says, I obtain mercy. Mercy. You'll never earn mercy. You can't pay for mercy. You can't be good enough for mercy. Mercy is based solely upon the, on, upon the one who gives you mercy. Hallelujah to God for mercy. Have you committed some heinous crime? Are you in here this morning? Have you destroyed people's lives? Are you haunted with that? Destroyed their life. You got what you wanted, didn't you? Did you live a filthy, ungodly life, still living a filthy, ungodly life? Are you living after the rudiments of this world? That's a filthy place out there. I remember someone saying one time, well, I said it myself. <laughs> I might as well just tell you what happened. I got off the plane in Okinawa. And this is not personal against anybody, but it stunk. There was a smell associated. When I got off of that plane, I was in the Marine Corps and I was going to my base. We flew in. And I got off of that thing and I smelled something. I smelled it. I was there 15 months. And I saw things in Okinawa. It's a different culture. I'm not up here this morning to offend people, but people in different parts of the world live differently than you do. You can see women out in the field using the bathroom. You see things. You, you're around things. You, you're around open sewage. You're around places just different. It's not like it is in America. If you've been living in a bubble all of your life and the only thing you've ever known is, is, is Disney World and Hollywood, you don't know what's in this world. You don't have a clue what's out there. But you, I never got used to that smell. I never got used to it. Never got stunk. Stunk from the time I got there to the time I left. And uh, it, it's one of those things that just, it, you'll never forget it. 
It just stays with you. It stays with you. I remember my grandfather, my grandmother as I grew up. There was dirt. You clean the dirt. House is dirty. Clean it up. But they find something here or there and they say, that's kyarn. And kyarn is not dirt. <laughs> How many of you know what kyarn is? <laughs> Say, I don't know what it is, but it doesn't sound good. You got that right. <laughs> it doesn't sound good. It's, it's pure filth. You see, that's what our culture has become, folks. It's no longer dirty. It's, 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 it's evolving into kyarn. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Do you live in a dread and fear today? You don't sleep. You toss and you turn. Satan attacked me last night in bed. While I was sleeping, oh, he came on me. I had a dream. Man, I know where that dream came from. came straight out of hell. I know exactly where it came from. I know him. And, of course, this was Saturday night before I get up to preach on Sunday morning. I know him. How many ever had the devil? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He did. He did. He doesn't like me. I don't like him either. <laughs> hey, we're not buddies. <laughs> Amen. Sworn enemies. No question about it. Are you haunted by these things? Well, there's only one plea. Just one. One plea, and I would that you do that today. God have mercy. God have mercy. Somebody tell me what that old sinner said when he went into the, went in before the Lord. The Pharisee said, I thank you, Lord, I'm not as other men, this, that, this, that, this. I tithe, I'm big in my church, you know, I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. But the old publican wouldn't so much as lift his head up. What did he say? God be merciful to what? God be merciful to me a sinner there's two of them in there now there's another one over there and I every day of my life I think about him Lord remember me <laughs> you wouldn't believe some of the stuff these people have said online about that thief let me tell you something if you are a self-righteous person eaten up with yourself totally obsessed with you yourself you don't like the idea of uh, Lord remember me you you don't like that but if you're in this house today and you want to get rid of some of that haunting some of that eating your soul alive just say Lord be merciful that's all I that's all I'm that's all I plead for is mercy be merciful to me a sinner Remember me, Lord. I'll tell you right now, if you mean that and you talk like that, you'll get in with God. You will be right with God before you walk out of this house today. Would you bow your head? Father, we thank you for the life of John the Baptist and what he taught us. None ever walked this earth any greater than John's, what you told us, and there's no question about it. I believe it, fully believe it. And we also know, Lord, that in ourself, in our strength, in our ability. We come so far short, so far, so far. We miss so much. We can't do it. We can't make it. But mercy, that's what I plead, mercy. God, remember me and remember them in Jesus' name. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Nobody looking. Anybody in the house today say, Preacher Lawson, I want God to be merciful to me. That's all I want. Mercy, God bless you. We've got hands going up everywhere. That's all I want, Lord. I want mercy. God bless you, every one of you. Hands all over the place. Say, so what can I say to him, uh, Lord, uh, the preacher? What can, what, what can I bring to him? Nothing. Just say, remember me. That's good enough. Remember me. That'll do it. Anybody in the house this morning, raise your hand and say, preacher, remember me. Let the Lord remember me. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Your word not going to return void. Thank you. Father, bless them now. Help these dear folk. Lord, we put them in Jesus' name in thy hands. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. All right. Stand up here this morning and sing. Would I come down here and pray? We'd like to meet you. Do whatever we can to help.
just dig just a little bit deeper now into Al Capone. That's called the Clark Street, Clark Street Garage in Chicago, Illinois. And if you go up there or talk to anyone who lives in that area or read some of the information that's available, you'll find out that on occasion they can hear Tommy guns going off inside that building. They see people in pinstripe suits walking into the walls, out of the wall. In plain words, there's a, obviously there's a manifestation of spirit beings in there. Say, so what is that? Here's what I think it is. I think that any time Satan is an opportunist, any time that he can use something to stir up interest in the spirit world and pull people into it because of simply, you know, curiosity, he'll pull you in deeper than you want to go. The Amityville Horror. I did some research into that. Did you know that a man took a, a, a 35 caliber, 35 Remington uh, lever action rifle and shot his family to death with it? Shot him to death inside that house. He went off to jail, but you see, a family moved into that house later, didn't know anything about any of that. And then all of a sudden, all of these so-called poltergeist manifestations started happening in the walls and sounds and apparitions and spirit in the very house where all these people had been murdered. Say, so what are they? They're not ghosts. They're demons taking advantage of a situation and sucking people into the spirit world in the wrong way. Leave it alone, folks. It's my responsibility as a pastor to inform you, and I go so deep into it, and then I stop. And it took me years to learn how, how far to go and then stop. Leave it alone. Can't go too far. But it's my responsibility as a bishop to show you, to teach you about these things. You're getting, you're getting a double whammy of it on TV now. It's coming, folks. It's coming down. What do you think they're doing? They're, they're preparing you to pick up a spirit that is associated with the Antichrist, and when he shows up, you're going to be connected directly with him. You remember that spirit that left the man? And when he came back, he brought seven. All right. Well, they're all associated with each other. He brought seven with him. He was worse off the se in the last state than he was at the beginning. This is what's happening now. You have, without the Holy Spirit, you have no protection. None. You have no protection. With the Holy Spirit, you have absolute protection. Amen. Amen. So stick with the Lord, pray, read your Bible, live for God, and rebuke these things if you need to when they come into your life. And if your kids get involved in this junk, get them out of it. Get them out of it. Ouija boards, tarot cards, all that stuff. Get them out of it. Because it's real, but it's not what you want to mess with. There's a problem with it. Amen. Well, I appreciate you listening. Uh, thank you. God will use it, no doubt about it. And probably somebody in the house or online who needed to hear what I said today. If you've got a past that you don't think you can be forgiven for, you can be forgiven for it. Amen. Yes, you can. You can be. Amen. The blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. Amen. I'll have prayer with you. We'll meet again this evening, 6 o'clock for the evening service. And uh, the Bible says to do this. It said singing to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Read God's word. Meditate on his word and pray. And that'll keep you safeguard from a whole lot of junk that's going on today. Amen. It'll protect you. All right, let's pray. Father, bless these dear folk. Keep them safe. Bring them back again this evening for the evening service at 6 o'clock, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Be careful, folks.